Hi folks, this is the 10 use case patterns. This is the last uh, slide deck number four in the discussion of the uh, 51 use cases identified by NIST. As well as the 51 Pacific use cases, they had 10 patterns which they identified. This is actually the work of Bob Marcus, who was a major leader in the initial part of the work. Uh, you can see I've annotated them a little, and I've also extended it a great deal in the case of science, when I introduced the sort of variant of this use pattern. So all right, let's get on to it. It's a relatively long uh, slide deck, but it's, it's sort of pretty interesting, and some of them are very, very insightful. Thank you very much. So now we come to the um, data interaction scenarios I mentioned as a key part of this particular presentation. This work is from Bob Marcus from ET Technology, who is an industry leader in the big data area, standards and technologies. There is a link here for his work, which is, comes from the NIST initiative, which we'll come back to later on. And if we, what we have here is not applications, which we'll actually come to later, but rather data interaction scenarios, which are common to many applications. So we have, we'll go through different data systems, which includes classical databases, streaming applications where data comes in, in a, in a one after another, a time series, archiving. We will look also at, as well as classic databases, Hive, which is, uh, sort of a database built from Hadoop. We'll look a little about analytics and workflow and the different ways users want to interact with the system, um, visualization and events. Um, we'll first list all 10 and then we'll go through each of the 10 in detail. This particular lesson only has the first five. So here are the 10. And uh, they're actually, some of them are more different from each other than others. Some are actually quite similar. Um, and some I've slightly changed from what Bob Marcus said. Uh, I may have done that incorrectly. It's, that's not his fault, it's my fault. And although they're called use cases, I would call them interaction scenarios. That's what use cases is how they were originally termed. And uh, we won't go through them here. That's just a list here for you. We will actually go through them one at a time. Here is the first uh, interaction scenario. We have a whole bunch of users, here they are. And they're doing interactive queries. This is generating the SQL query. And then they're asking a data storage system, which is either a relational database, HDFS, HBase. And then it's being queried either by a relational database, uh, SQL on Hadoop, Hadoop itself, Apache Drill, which is a particular general approach, sort of an alternative to Hive. And here comes the data, it's either fixed, it's streaming, and it's uh, come in batches. And we have what's called a base, which is this basic availability and eventual consistency, which is a key to getting good scalable performance, or the more precise and robust asset performance of totally um, clear semantics and ordering of every activity. So this is sort of the classic database extended to a Hadoop type environments. Here we have the next one, this is a fun one, pretty important, streaming data. So here comes the data roaring in and it gets posted somewhere in the data processing system. Uh, we will show how to use publish subscribe systems like RabbitMQ or Kafka. Um, and then this whole environment here is often done with Storm. Storm allows you to post data, access it automatically, run it through so-called so bolts, which are processing elements. And then you maintain consistency between these multiple events and how they're processed through Zookeeper, which is this distributed coordination system, especially important for metadata. It's not really for coordinating huge amounts of data, it's for coordinating the core control data. And here we have the user telling the system what to do, which is the filter, which becomes a bolt in storm. And that filter is applied 
to the posted data, giving you new data, which is identified or modified. And then maybe both of these actually get put into a repository. Very important application. Streaming data comes from the Internet of Things, IoT. It comes from people. People stream data like Twitter feeds and blogs and what have you. And um, smartphones are always streaming data. In fact, smartphones are all used, controlled by the cloud. So the smartphone is the best example of this type of streaming data. Now we have uh, a um, sort of, let's move uh, data into Hadoop type application and uh, stick it off into uh, an enterprise data warehouse where it might actually be after this processing here, uh, actually <coughs> accessed through SQL. So here we have the different forms of data. Digitize your file cabinet, stream your data. You have a web service delivering data to you. It already exists in a database. And you do this extract, load, and transform process. Extract it, load it into the system, transform it. That's what this transform is here. And then you stick it in your data, data warehouse, which is the classic industry way of storing the data which the analysts will use. This approach is not done with these words in science. We don't have data warehouses in science, at least not with that name. We do have the equivalent of data warehouses. Here we have the fourth one, which is um, effectively Hive. Namely, we start off with our data, which is sort of the same before. It gets put in um, the sort of modern Apache for, um, store, either HBase, which is equivalent to Google Bigtable, which is this uh, distributed table storage with um, flexible schemas, which can be changed on, on uh, dynamically. And we have the back end file system, which is often Hadoop uh, file system, HDFS. And then we have this processing, which is uh, either Hadoop, the classic, Spark, iterative MapReduce, Giraffe, graph processing. Pig, which is a high level language which can drive probably any of all these three here, but usually it drives a dupe. Then on top of this, we can have the SQL query, which is Hive, or Shark, or Drill, or something like that. And Hive uses H catalog to implement its uh, SQL magic. And here we have all our users. Doing, uh, asking all these questions, and now getting more cost-effective performance by using a dupe as the engine, because the dupe gives more cost-effective, scalable, parallel performance. Actually, once you got up to this level, you don't have to use SQL. You can, of course, just run your favorite uh, data analytics using uh, Mahout or R, which are standard libraries that are available to manipulate data stored in a dupe. Here's the next interaction. This is going to be an important one, number five, because it actually is how science is done. Actually, actually before that, we have an example of um, Hive, which is from this link here. This was identified by Bob Marcus. And uh, we have here the Hive client. The uh, Metastore server, relational database, that holds the metadata. Hive itself uses MapReduce to process HDFS. And here's the data feeding itself into HDFS. So this is finally this fifth act, act case, which is interactive analytics, which is really just the Mahout R example, which I showed to the right of, of case four. In fact, this is pretty similar to case four, which just said it was batch. But interactive and batch sort of look same architecturally. It just depends how they're scheduled and what the how the how uh, responsive the interaction is. So here we have our same things here: Hadoop, Spark, Giraffe, Pig. We have the same storage, HDFS and HBase, and we have the same data. So this is. Um, just not going through, we just left off the SQL part of it. 
And I say this one generalizes rather well because typically in scientific data you are doing some sort of analytics, not actually usually from a do for R, but actually R is used a lot in biology. And um, we will come to that in the next lesson. So that's the end of this lesson. And uh, we will and uh, that's documented here. And we just go through a few examples. There are many like this, and some are actually a little different, but uh, you will see why we do the ones we do. So here we come back to actually access pattern five. We call it 5A because we add observational scientific data as the interactive analytics. And uh, let's just review what we have here and compare it. We have our basic uh, big data stack here, Hadoop, Spark, Giraffe, Pig. Here we add actually grid software, because that's often used in science still today. It's still very relevant for many scientific applications. We'll actually see why again when we look at some of the examples. Um, here we have Mahout and R still just uh, related to the previous world. But typically, most science has custom analysis code built for each field. Here we have the data storage. Now, very little science, if any, almost any, is actually analyzed with the Apache stack. So here, actually, file collection is probably the dominant scientific model. However, many of them could use the Apache stack and usefully use Apache and big data storage models. So what type of ways do we feed data in? That's sort of important. An important key idea. So we have direct transfer. That would be scientists studying, say, Twitter data, or maybe uh, data from the Internet of Things. That data might actually get uh, directly streamed into the data storage. That's actually pretty similar to the way it's done commercially. However, a lot of scientific data looks a little different. You have an experiment which gathers data. It could be an experiment to the North Pole, an experiment to a river. It could be a satellite. It could be a gene sequencer in some laboratory. <clears throat> and that data is in the field. That's the observational step. Data is gathered in, the, in the, wherever it's uh, given off. Now, what do you do with that data? Well, you do uh, two things. You actually often, and this is also true with commercial data, you do some initial computing. That initial computing is often done to reduce the volume of the data, or possibly just because you have more computers uh, locally than you do centrally. That's true in the particle physics case. So you do some initial computing, transforming the scientific data from taken in the field to um, a more refined form. In the data information knowledge wisdom pipeline, this could be called often the data to information step. That data is accumulated locally. Um, if this was data taken uh, in a um, expedition to the North Pole, you might accumulate it for a month uh, from your uh, various uh, radar scans and seismic scans and things like that. They will be stored on tapes, and then those tapes would actually be sent back here to your main analysis system. So this is a batched data transfer. This data transfer occurs not in a direct streaming fashion, as we sort of see it said, uh, saw over here, but it's uh, done every every week, every month, or whatever is natural for the problem at hand. And then we look at some examples, the particle physics, Large Hadron Collider, uh, astronomy, bioinformatics, and remote sensing, uh, which is this uh, North and South Pole example where we're looking at what happens, uh, the data taken uh, from sc radar scans. All right, here we have the particle physics case. And we will actually look at that in the following unit in some more detail, because it's one of the examples we go through in detail. And here we'll just make some rather general remarks. The data is taken here at CERN. 
And this is one, one of the four um, major experiments, the so-called CMS experiment. They all actually look relatively similar. The experiments tend to detect everything with a whole set of various um, detectors. So the particles collide. Then, uh, then the results of those collisions are gathered. Uh, they actually uh, they go through some initial uh, stage uh, very near the ex uh, experimental apparatus to select the most interesting events. And then they're sent off to first CERN, which is the so-called tier zero center. And then they're sent all over the world. And this world is arranged in a hierarchical fashion. There are various big centers. This is the Rutherford Lab in England. Here is Fermi Lab in the USA. These are national centers. You actually have maybe one or two of these big centers in a given country or continent. Then these, are sent, then these national centers get farmed out to different um, tier two centers, which are typically university-based. And then we go to tier three centers, which are sort of labs of physicists and things like that. Um, notice the scale of this. There are sort of 2,500 of these things at tier, the tier three level. And uh, there are 40 countries, that's this level here, or possibly. And uh, we get tens of petabytes per year. Remember, I pointed out that um, even 100 petabytes is a very small fraction of the seven zettabytes that we gather uh, this year. Uh, Indiana University, where I, I'm from, it has a role here at the tier two for one of, not the CMS experiment, but for the ATLAS experiment. So um, here we have these many petabytes per year. These are actually sort of a variant of the batch and local processing. They're just lots of computers around the world, which form the so-called grid of distributed systems. And most of the processing is done on those computers, around 300,000 cores in total. Uh, those computers break down the data, and the thing that actually gets sent for the final analysis and examination by the physicist is reduced in size. That actually tends to get replicated so it can be looked at by many different physicists. So this is a very, this is sort of consistent with that model, but different. And one of the reasons it's different is that this whole computing model was developed before clouds existed, started around probably 2000 in, in, in depth. And at that time, the best way to gather computers together appeared to be to take the world's computers and put them, view them as one. That's the grid concept. Whereas the cloud concept is different. It doesn't take the world's computers and view them as one. It puts all the, all the computers in one place or in a few places at the, at the large cloud data centers. So the next example where we have uh, some slides is astronomy. So astronomy. And from particle physics, we looked at just one accelerator. There are actually other accelerators which are, can be viewed similarly. But in astronomy, there are lots of uh, telescopes. Here is a particular telescope, or um, the new one that went Chile for the so-called Dark Energy Survey. Now we have these telescopes gathering data around the world. Here's typical data from the uh, from the Dark Energy Survey. This this little area here is shown in detail here. So what do we do? We take the data in Chile. Um, we ship that data to a site in the US. In the case here, I think it goes to largely Berkeley or um, uh, Illinois, NCSA at Illinois. And then it's actually processed there and stuck up on um, disks. And then it actually ends up as part of the so-called International Virtual Observatory, which is an international collection of data. Now this is actually an important aspect of science data, which is a little different from sort of the politics or techno the way that data is gathered commercially. When you're on Facebook, you gather Facebook data. However, when you're an astronomer, or at least a, an analysis astronomer, you actually don't just look at your own data, you look at everybody's data. And that's the whole idea of the virtual observatory. Data is gathered by many people. 
that data is then looked at by either the same people or a different group of people who join data together, in the case of us, either from different telescopes or at different wavelengths, because each telescope or each wavelength then looks at the world in a very different fashion. So the, it's a critical point of multidisciplinary, or in this case, multi-wavelength science, that your data is almost inevitably distributed, it cannot be centralized. And so some of the assumptions underlying the big data stack don't quite work. These issues I don't think are very well understood. Okay, folks, the second slide on dark energy, this one's a relatively simple slide. It basically describes one aspect of the data analysis, which was done in Illinois, um, University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign, and the organization called NCSA, which is the major, one of the major um, high performance computing activities in the country or in the world. It's also done at NERSC, which is a DOE facility at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And um, here they, the data is actually sent over standard optical networks. And um, here you have um, uh, a plot of the performance of the analysis system, because you have to respond in real time. Here's the actual cluster that does that. At, um, NCSA, and um, here's the sort of a pipeline of activities. And um, these are Exceed and FNL, which is Fermilab. These are just computing resources, and uh, which are used to do additional computing. But probably all the real time work, which has to have uh, latency control, is done in this cluster here. And um, you can see that the science exposures are in a, they are arrive and they're basically ingested in three minutes. So that's uh, pretty interesting. Okay, thank you. That's so. We now go on to the final astronomy discussion. This um, plot here. Oh, oh, sorry, I should say. Slide here shows a wrinkle here of, a, of this general idea. This is for the Hubble Space Telescope. Here we have typical results from Hubble, beautiful structure here. And here's an illustration of what it's discovered at various depths into the past, uh, into the early universe. And you can now see uh, what happens. Here we have Hubble. Hubble goes to a satellite actually gets goes up to us to a NASA satellite that NASA satellite goes down to a ground station in White Sands New Mexico and then that goes uh, all over to the Hubble Space Telescope Institute which is in Baltimore Maryland but the, it's actually a similar idea here the data is transported more in a streaming fashion um, although it is probably often done in batch mode um, so this is so you can see the way the data is staged into the analysis system it does depend somewhat on the size of the apparatus and the nature of the events. But in astronomy, it's reasonably similar to that streaming model. Now here's a rather different uh, one which I'm associated with, with our so-called remote sensing, where we do radar surveys. This is to study the nature of uh, the ice sheets or glaciers in the North and South Pole or on uh, mountains like the Himalayas. Here, you, the, the, the brave scientists interested in this area, they go out on an expedition that lasts one or two months, and it might gather up to 100 terabytes of data. And most of that data, in, this, in our case, is stored on removable disks, and it is flown back to the continental US at the end of the experiment. Uh, note that one of the reasons you do this is the bandwidth. Here we show some sort of satellite receiving data, um, which is coming from the North Pole and going back to a so-called polar grid laboratory. That satellite does not have enough bandwidth to transmit the entire data sample. So you can only get samples this way. Um, this, if we look at this picture we have here, here, so here's the Processing in the in the USA at Indiana and Elizabeth City State. 
Here we have people at the North and South Pole. Here's a typical aircraft which flies with radar on it. And um, that t takes the, the, the data which is actually uh, processed to make images. And those images are used to determine the uh, depth of um, ice and snow and things like that. But here we do have a clear batching. Uh, we do not get the data from the experiment uh, in a streaming fashion as we do with those tweets and the astronomical data. We just get it every now and then at the end of an experiment. Here we have the last science example, which is yet a little different again. Here we don't have one giant apparatus. As we sort of had in some of the previous examples, astronomy, particle physics, and even the remote sensing, where really there was just one one large apparatus, the radar um, recorder for each um, experiment. We have lots of devices sequencing genes. That comes from the drastic reduction in um, uh, cost of these devices and this means that you can put gene sequences all over the place in different people's labs. They sort of cost, I think, around even now as, as little as $100,000. Um, now, that means that you're getting this data streaming out in a distributed fashion across the world. Now, you're going to do some initial processing, probably locally, because uh, these machines produce so called reads. The reads are the shown actually here. There's a, these little uh, small strips, maybe I uh, say 250 bases long, um, sometimes smaller, sometimes bigger. Uh, the bigger the better, because that leads to uh, less ambiguity in the assembly. And then there's uh, an important uh, so called assembly or alignment stage, which takes all these reads and decides how to put, stitch them together to make a complete genome. And that's. Um, the end of, um, that's how you get your gene sequence. Illumina is probably the dominant vendor in this field. It just announced actually their largest machine, the uh, iSeq X10, which uh, is ingeniously designed to get the to meet the goal of $1,000 per genome. It produces uh, almost a tera uh, almost a 10 to the 12th basis every day. Here's a picture of it from the uh, company website. And so you can produce um, an awful lot of data with these machines. Now that data is, I say, typically processed locally. But in order to make progress, you actually have to, you typically want to compare it not only with other data taken with the same machine, but also with the world's other, rest of the world's data, because you're looking for differences. And comparing your gene with some, with the gene you just sequenced with uh, the, rest of the world's genes. That's done with uh, programs uh, which are very famous, like BLAST. That's a typical comparison program, uh, which itself runs in parallel, comparing gene se uh, sequences with a distributed database of existing sequences. Then at the end of all that, you'll get something where here we show some of our own work, which is some, these are the prote pro proteomics, protein sequences, and here's clusters. Project, uh, shown here, projected into three dimensions so you can view them. It's just only a two-dimensional slice of a three-dimensional, um, two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional uh, three dimensional representation of the data. So here is a little subtle, we actually again match, because you'll probably run multiple multiple sequences at the same time in every on every machine. But it's also distributed, namely your genes are being gathered all around the world. Again, it's not likely that possibly all the genes will end up at a big NIH center or a, or a European Bioinformatics Institute center. And so most of the genes might end up in uh, one or two places so that you can do a good comparison, although those places typically don't have enough computing to do all the comparisons you need. So here we have a little challenge of, of deciding where to store the data taking this distributed data, uh, processed in a rather heterogeneous fashion and trying to understand what to do. So this is a, again a slightly different variant of the same idea of field data processed locally, done in batches, 
sent off to some sort of central site. So that's the end of our discussion of science. We will return to the other uh, general access patterns in the next uh, lesson. So that's what he says here. It's the remaining five general access patterns described with a more enterprise uh, point of view, because Bob Marcus invented these, and his, that's his great expertise. All right, we have our beautiful users here, such as ClipArt and Microsoft PowerPoint. And what are they doing? They're trying to interact with the, um, with the big data software stack. And it has here four layers, which we can discuss. Actually, first, let's, so we can actually say what we're doing here. Uh, these users are telling a system what to do with the data. They're specifying the analytics, running a clustering, running a blast job, trying to do a histogram, just find the Higgs boson. And then that actually prepares an interactive visualization, because the eye is so much better than um, uh, when it looks at pictures and then when it looks at numbers. And so that visualization is then interactive with uh, back and forth, uh, rotating it, changing parameters, and so on. And here we have this orchestration layer, which is almost inevitable, because uh, when we're doing all of this, we're going to be doing different things. We're going to be running our favorite Mahout clustering algorithm, and then followed by our favorite um, visualization preparation algorithm. So this means we'll have multiple jobs, and that's precisely what orchestration does. It makes those jobs talk to each other properly. This then sits on the standard horizontally scalable um, layer, Hadoop, Spark, Giraffe, Pig, Twister, Harp, etc. And that sits on top of the data storage, which here we've not We've just left at the standard big data uh, thing, HDFS, HBase, MongoDB, et cetera. So this is a really sort of simple case. It summarizes a large number of problems. And it say it's actually true both for the enterprise doing data analysis and for science. Science would just differ by what happens here, how the data arrives at this in this storage. All right, here we have something which, actually, I guess, you know, variant of this is some relevant uh, to science. Here we have our data, the various sorts, filing cabinets, streaming data, produced by a machine, or even coming out of a database. That's probably the most common in the enterprise. That gets loaded into the data storage. Of course, we're doing this loading so we can use the very efficient, highly scalable, parallel, um, big data processing here, this is the Hadoop Spark giraffe layer, because that's more efficient than traditional databases uh, for very large uh, processing. And they're gonna transform the data in some fashion, which is actually gonna be specified by this charming user here. And then they're gonna actually end up by putting it into a data warehouse, which is almost by definition the place that our user users to query the data interactively to find out about the future uh, of the world, or the future of the company, or the, what's happening in science today. So this is, again, a simple variant of what happened before. The, you know, we have the same two typical horizontally scalable programming, data storage, and we have somewhat different beginning and ending from before. Here is an example from Teradata, which is a major database company. It was actually one of the very first to do parallel computing. I remember how that started many, many years ago in the early 80s. And here we have all our people, engineers, data scientists, quants doing the fiscal analysis for Wall Street, business analysis, deciding how to market things. Here we have all the things we bring to bear, Python, R, we've seen all that. Um, SQL map produced that will be a, their version of Hive and so on. And um, they have um, their traditional, you know, all these big vendors have the traditional approach over here, in which they also supplement by the uh, big data stack approach, and they try to bring them together. We sort of saw that by using uh, this um, MapReduce portfolio 
to produce to move it to the to the warehouse, which is shown here. So this is just Teradata's variant of that previous graph. Here we have a slight variant of it, where instead of um, um, going to a data warehouse, we may put it in an archive. Um, we have, these are the query engines, Hive is SQL on Hadoop, Drill is a variant of that, and of course we have Hadoop as Spark, Giraffe as well. Here are all our transformation tools. Typically we might actually put Hive and Drill above Hadoop, and Spark, etc. And here we have our storage, and we have exactly the same stores of data, sources of data. And then we, instead of sending it to a warehouse, we put it into our archive uh, for looking at later if we really need to. Um, so that's a variant of the warehouse problem. Here we have a somewhat different problem, uh, which is uh, actually similar to what you see in science a lot. You need to combine data from lots of different sources. Here we have lots of clouds. I showed you a few clouds here. In some graph, actually earlier we compared Google Drive, iCloud, Box, Dropbox, OneDrive, and so on. Here we have our streaming data going directly. And these are coming from the outside of our organization. And then we might have our own data. Here we are, we're a giant a consumer company with our own data. Or we're a giant search company. And uh, we want to, of course, combine them so we can compare what people we deal with do, which is this data with what the rest of the world does, which is this data. And then we have actually the identical stack here from before. Same old storage, same old big data storage, same old horizontal scalable big data software, and the same old analytics. And then we have our charming um, decision maker looking at all of this and making the decision which will make another billion dollars for our company. Here's an example of this, which uh, comes from, uh, uh, which was chosen by Bob Marcus. Uh, comes from a particular uh, source. Here we have the enterprise warehouse and a particular commercial application. Um, and we have these different sources. You know, obviously the weather is correlated with how people feel and whether they want, what type of clothes they want. Here we have com commodities coming in, the price of the nature of commodities, and here we have data from industry. All of this is joined together with our own local data, and this produces the decisions that tell us what to do. So this is just one example of this idea of that an critical thing to do, we have to integrate data. Now that's because remember we need to bring the computing to the data. That's tricky. If while your data comes from different sources. So what you see here is a, is a sort of trivial strategy. We first bring all the data to the same place, then we bring the computing to that place. Whether that really works and what the cost of that compared to other methods like doing a distributed algorithm uh, remains to be seen. I don't think that answer is very well understood. Here we have uh, the final example, scenario example 10 which is um, actually similar to what we had before, except it has this crucial orchestration layer spelled out a bit more, which is the workflow showing different an an analytics, uh, a clustering followed by a multi-dimensional scaling, followed by a visualization package. We have the same bottom two layers as before. And we have our favorite analysts both specifying what to do and looking at the final answer. And if we added again data staging at the bottom here, we would get a very, very important and common scientific case. And we have an example of that given in the next slide, which comes from Horton Works. Horton Works are a major sort of, a, this is a very important industry. It comes from people who um, either um, they package the Apache Big Data Stack in various ways, and they ingeniously donate to Apache their, some of their own software, which locks people on into their own software. Hortonworks is like that, Cloudera is like that. And here is um, the 
this is about yarn, which was, I, I gather, I think uh, an invention originally of Horton Mux, but now it's part of a dupe and in open source. And it shows how you can actually integrate all these different components in this single yarn scheduling system. So that's uh, a typical example of how we orchestrate a lot of different approaches to the problem. So that's the end of our discussion of data access. When you do your problems, you'll be, you know, your data will have to be accessed. So you might come back to these patterns to see which of these patterns fits the way your data gets produced, the data gets processed, and the data gets analyzed and looked at by your uh, um, company analysts. Thank you very much. The next uh, part D of this. Um, of this uh, unit, we'll discuss how the Apache Big Data Stack fits into this uh, in a little more detail.